stuff talk. And there's a little bit of this, just so you know, I'm going to make all the code available. Um, I'll send it to Richard and he'll put it all on online. So you'll be able to get to all the code. Don't worry about that. One of the big pieces of, of code that I'm going to be using comes from a book, an ebook I wrote that's up on PowerShell.org called Creating Trend and Historical Reports in PowerShell. Uh, the subtitle is Ditch Excel. And that kind of tells you where the, the idea for all of this came from. And it's because every time I go around to customers or, or once a week in the blog uh, or in the, the forums on PowerShell.org, we get someone asking, how do I and then insert the, the description of some incredibly complicated task in Excel. And what I think, it's, it, it's important to recognize that a lot of us use Excel as a database because we have it, right? It's on all of our machines, it's just there, and, and so we stick data into it. Excel is not a database. Um, SQL Server, on the other hand, is a database. And SQL Server is something that can run on servers, it can run, okay, you have to put the spoon down. It's like spiking my level meter up here. <laughs> um, SQL Server is something that can run on a server. Excel can't or shouldn't, right? SQL Server is something that can centrally serve lots of machines. Do you know how many machines can connect to SQL Server at a time? Tons, lots. You know how many machines can connect to an Excel spreadsheet at once? <laughs> One if you're lucky. <laughs> it takes four lines of code to put data into SQL Server or get data out of it, four lines. Doing that same thing in Excel requires hundreds of lines of code. SQL Server connectivity, as, and, and I don't want to be overly biased, um, I'm used to SQL Server, but you could say the same thing about any RDBMS. This applies to MySQL or Oracle or any other thing you want to use. You can connect to it with the four lines of code and that support is built into the .NET framework that PowerShell is built on. When you want to do programmatic stuff with an Excel spreadsheet, you're using like a decade old COM interface that's been wrapped in .NET, that's been wrapped in PowerShell, that's been wrapped in a croissant, and it just, it's slow. It's difficult to use because PowerShell can't see everything about it very easily. And so we'll have these folks get in the forums and they'll post these 400 line scripts that are basically designed to do nothing but create a grid of information that I know for a fact I could do almost instantaneously with four lines of well-written SQL Server code in PowerShell. And so the idea, kind of the beginning of this was clearly people have some fear of SQL that is making them still use Excel. So let's eliminate that fear and make it as easy as possible. So that's kind of the first thing we'll do. Is I'll just show you how it is actually extremely straightforward to take whatever inventory data you have gathered about your machines, maybe disk space, which is something perhaps we would like some trend reporting on, yes? how to get that and shove it into a SQL Server without any knowledge of SQL Server whatsoever. But then I wanted to go a little bit further. Now, it is nice to have things in a database because there's reporting tools, right? So instead of writing 400 lines of code to insert a chart into an Excel spreadsheet, you can just run something like SQL Server Reporting Services, build a really beautiful report, and have it automatically emailed to whoever wants it, taking you out of the loop. And I like that. Uh, I'm going to build everything I do off of SQL Server Express, which is free and costs no money. And if you get the advanced version, so the, the big download, it comes with reporting services. So everything I'm going to show you will not cost you any money or licensing or anything else. You can obviously use any SQL Server or other database that's in your environment, but Excel is not a database. So the next thing we're going to do is talk about how that scales. How many machines do you have? Anybody? Shout out numbers. 10,000, 40,000. Do I hear 50,000, 50,000? <laughs> if you get into an environment where maybe you want to uh, have a, a startup script on your servers or a logon script or a scheduled script that's going to run every, every day or week or whatever else, and you have 50,000 servers all trying to jam data into a SQL Server Express instance, it's not going to work. Express just won't take that many connections. Uh, even a full-size SQL Server can get a little stressy if 50,000 people try to connect at the exact same moment. And that can also be a problem in a WAN environment. Have you, how many of you have more than one location that are connected by a, a WAN link? How many of you have bad WAN links? Because they're any other kind. <laughs> no one has ever said, oh, my WAN link is just so full of bandwidth that I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to show you how to create something called a lazy data loader. 
And the idea is that you can have machines in different locations creating their inventory, putting it into sort of a temporary holding area, and having another script come along and gradually read that into the database just as fast as it can, but not worrying about getting it all quickly. It's like, eventually, I'll get this all loaded in. Everybody just put your stuff here, and I'll sort through it as it comes in. Kind of like dropping clothes off at the charity. You just dump it in, and then other people go through, and they sort out the underwear from the clothes they can resell. Uh, so that's kind of where we're going to go. Sound good? Yeah. OK. So let's start with a little script that uh, this is a data report, a SQL reporting module. This is actually provided as part of that ebook I mentioned, Creating Trend and Historical Reports in PowerShell. Now, this is not the awesomest database code in the universe by a long stretch, but it had a couple of, of specific goals and a couple of specific things I didn't care about. This is designed to take data that you, an admin, have produced. It is not designed to consume input from coming from some idiot on a web server who's trying to crash your machine. This is designed to take relatively trusted data. It is designed to create an absolutely no brains required environment. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to run through it real quick uh, and then I'll, I'll walk through it. So this is my SQL server. I'm going to hit refresh and I just want to... Do you guys have a cooking channel here? Like we have cooking channel and cooking TV and food TV and all... You don't. You just don't eat. You know who Julia Child is? Everybody knows who Julia Child is, right? Children. So the thing with these cooking shows is always they take the big bowl and they pour all the ingredients and they mix it and they put it under the counter and they pull out one that a production assistant did three days earlier and it's like, beautiful. And you know yours is never going to look like that. So we call that Julia Childing a demo because she kind of invented that TV thing. I just want to prove that I don't have anything here. There's nothing pre-done. Everything I'm going to do is real. So the only databases I have here are my system databases and the ones for SQL Express's uh, reporting server. Okay? So nothing on my sleeve. Let's hop down here to a console. And I've created, real quick, this is another command I've created to get disk space info. Uh, and I'll give you this one too. And this isn't doing much fancy. It can take one or more computer names and it's just going to go get disk space from them. For every disk, it's going to print out an object that has the computer name, uh, where is the computer name, the device ID, which is the drive letter, the amount of free space, the total size, and then the date that that information was collected. Because this is going to allow me to eventually do a trend report, right? If I sequence these things by the date, then I'll be able to see the disk space go up or down over time. So that's all this is doing. So let's just run that real quick. Uh, that's called get disk space space info and I'll just run it against the local machine so we can kind of see what it produces. So that's what it does. Okay. The trick here, in order to make it work with that, that magic data command I wrote, I give my output object a custom type name. And it starts with the word report. And that is a hard-coded dependency of the way I wrote the function. If you don't like that, you can change it. Uh, it's only there because I liked it. There's no technical reason for it. And a period, and then disk space info. And that's what I want to that's that's what I want to call this object. This is a disk space info object. And I'll show you where that gets used when we run this. So the name of this function is get disk space info, and I'm going to use it to save my report data. So we're going to run this again, pipe it to save dash report data. Because I am using my local SQL Server Express instance. I'm going to use the local Express database name parameter. Now, perhaps you're not going to. Perhaps you're going to use another SQL Server or another kind of database that's located elsewhere, and you would simply provide a connection string. Do you guys know where all the connection strings in the universe can be found? Connectionstrings.com. Connectionstrings if you need to build a connection string for any version of any database that has ever been created by human science, you go to connectionstring.com and it'll tell you how to build it. And you just feed that connection string to it. So I'm going to use the local. And let's just call it uh, disk inventory. This database does not exist. We proved that, right? Remember? I did the whole food TV talk. Okay. Uh, it's getting late. I'm just a little worried. Uh, and I believe if we look, 
all I have to have is an input object, which I'm getting from the pipeline, and then that local express database name. Those are the only things I have to do. I don't know anything about SQL Server. I just installed SQL Express. I'm running this as a user who has access to, to the, the database instance. I've written a command that retrieves inventory information. It can be anything you want. And the only caveat is it should have a date on it so that you can order these things for trend lines if that's what you want to do. And it has to have a type name that starts with report period something else. God damn it. <laughs> um, it failed to connect to SQL Express. I wonder if... Uh, Yeah. yeah. Service running? I'm good. Yeah, well, it should be because I can get to it over here, right? Uh, that should need to be. Firewall? Mock SQL Express. Let's troubleshoot it. SQL Express database connection is get computer name SQL Express database equals yada 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 trusted. Oh, I know why. You do have to go create the database first which it occurs to me I didn't do. Disk inventory, we're going to call it. So new database, disk inventory, there. Let's try it again. Oops, try it again. Uh, I've got some verbose stuff in there, so I'm just going to yes to all. Oops. Uh, and now, if I go to my, over here, there's disk inventory. It has created a table called disk space info. Can you read that? Can you read it now? It's created that disk space info because that's what the object name was. Remember, it was report dot disk space info. So it created that table with that name. And then in there, it created columns for all the object properties. And it even figured out that this is a date time, and this is a string, and that's a string, and these are numbers. And so it created appropriate data types. Now if I do this again, let me run in here and turn off the verbosity real quick. Actually, I think I had a debug in here. There it is. We'll remove that so that change takes effect, clear the screen, start over. So I get a little bit of verbose output, but it doesn't stop. Uh, and now if I go to my SQL Server, it has not created a new second copy of that table. It has simply added a second row to it. So if I select, since I've run that twice now, I should have two rows of data. And slightly different timestamps because I ran them shortly after each other. So this is the first part. This is, if you're, if you're building your inventory collection tool, so in this case it's my get disk info or get disk size or whatever, if you're building that and you're following good PowerShell practices and you're outputting one object that has properties, then you could format a table out of that, you could export it to a CSV file, or you could easily send it to a SQL Server table. That's way simpler than trying to automate Excel. And now if I want to build a beautiful report on this, I can just get SQL Server reporting services out and build whatever reports and lines and charts and graphs that I want. And reporting services can generate those automatically and deliver them as PDF or as email or drop them on a web server. And so whoever needs those reports can just have them without you having to do anything. You can set up a schedule to run your command so that once a week, once a month, once a day, whatever you need, the inventory information gets updated into SQL Server and, or into to the database, and then the reports run. You can take yourself totally out of the loop. My goal when I, I, I worked, especially in frontline IT, was to make sure no one had any reason to call me. And that means automating it, right? So this is a fairly simple way to automate it without having, I can run this on a server that doesn't have to have anything installed except .NET. There's no client piece of SQL Server that you have to go run around and install. It's built into .NET. Every copy of PowerShell has it already. You don't have to install drivers or anything else. Good so far? Yep. Okay. Questions so far? 
Yeah. Uh, more of a comment. Uh, if you are really masochistic and want to use XLA language, you could also use the ESPL server as a data source inside it. Um, if you were really masochistic and you wanted to use Excel anyway, you could use it as your data source in the connection stream. Except that the only way to do that is to also have access installed because the ability to treat Excel as a database is part of the access driver. Yeah, no, what I mean is if you want to deliver reports to someone who is adamant about getting an Excel spreadsheet, you can just tell them to point their data source in Excel to the SQL database. You're saying oh, data oh so yeah, so if you've got somebody who says, no, you have to send me an Excel spreadsheet. No, I'll go you one better. SQL Server reporting services can spew Excel just as easily as a PDF okay. or something else. That's the beauty of it. It supports like 11 dozen file formats. So yeah, you don't have to do anything special. Or if somebody wanted to do pivot tables and all kinds of junky, crazy stuff, yeah, you can just tell them, point your Excel to this database, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world, and you don't have to be involved. That's the idea. It's supposed to give you vacation time. Anything we should be aware of uh, with regards to, uh, to local culture? Uh, I tried accessing uh, speaking uh, data in a particular server at one point and part of it maybe because of the date form. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in this case, because my uh, command that got inventory is just using get date, it's going to produce a date time object. And I feed that, let me see how I feed that to SQL Server. I, I think I just feed it the date time object. It just gets the object directly. That should, in most cases, be relatively culture immune. But when you create your database you need to make sure that that you're selecting the right culture mm -hmm. options in sql server that one-time database creation deal uh, as well as to, to match whatever your machines are running i'd have it rigged right now just to do a generic date time uh, in fact if we look over here i can show you some of the magic that this does i've got a separate command called test database that gets called and this is what checks to see if the database exists and if it has the schema set up. So I go through an example uh, object and I check to see if one of the properties is a date time. And if it is, I use the SQL Server date time too. This will only work on I don't know, like SQL Server 2005 and later, re relatively recent stuff, maybe 2008. This is relatively cultural and culture insensitive. It's not a string, and it doesn't ever get a string. So under the hood, it's really just a uh, a large number. So it should be okay most of the time. I try not to deal with dates as strings because of that, because you never know if it's month and day or whatever else. Do you know that if there's a similar thing to get date time of set? To get date time of of set. So you have both like. From UTC, you are minus nine hours. Oh, uh, yeah, you could do that off of the the um, you could do that off get date get date. So if you look at the object that get date produces, you've got a bunch of methods that'll spew different versions of it, including a uh, a UTC version in here somewhere to universal time. Yeah, so you could do that if you wanted. So if you're coordinating across a lot of time zones and you want to make sure everybody's using a common you would just attach that to your output object instead of just get date. You'd say get date to universal time and stick that in the database instead. The database doesn't care, but it will keep a time zone offset. That's one of the neat things about the date time to data type is that it can include a time zone offset. Cool, what else? So easy enough to get data into SQL Server, right? Easy peasy. So let's talk about the next bit. Let's imagine that I've got multiple locations all around the world. They don't have great WAN connectivity. I don't necessarily want all of my servers in every location slamming onto a single SQL server, right? Option number one, and this is kind of where my head went first, was, well, SQL Server Express is cheap, right? It's free. So why don't I just set up an Express database in each of my locations and use merge replication to replicate that data up to a central place to report on. Seem reasonable? No, it is not reasonable for two reasons. Nothing is free. SQL Server might, Express might not cost you licensing money, but it costs you maintenance money. It's software. It's going to have to be patched. You're going to have to make sure it's running. That's kind of a pain. Um, so that's not ideal. 
And the other piece is uh, SQL Server. Anybody ever use SQL Server replication or have to troubleshoot it? It's a piece of crap, right? Yeah, that's the other reason. <laughs> it's just one more moving part in your life that you genuinely don't need. Um, I'm a, I, old, I, I, my first job was in the AS400 world, and I've worked a lot in Unix and Linux before I, I came over to the Microsoft side of things. And I've always been amazed, and this is changing now, but I was always amazed at how hard Microsoft tried to make everything. Um, you know, for a long time we had CSV files. You remember those? Basic text, you could pop it open. And Microsoft really didn't get in on the data interchange industry very early, and so they got really behind XML which is let's wrap as much extra crap around our data as humanly possible to make it bigger than necessary. Uh, and they're starting to walk away from that now. They're much bigger fans of JSON, which is much lighter. Uh, but this whole idea of let's stick everything in databases and move it around in databases all the time always struck me as weird. So I decided I wanted to kind of take a different approach for this. And this is what I'm calling the, the, the lazy loader. Uh, and here's the, the basis for it. On a given server, instead of running this, so just refresh your memory. What's this do? Puts it, now, here's a problem with this. If I'm doing this on bunches of servers, that's not going to be local express database name, right? I'm going to have to provide a connection string. Well, what's part of a connection string usually? It's got the server name. It's got the database name. It's got the, the credentials. Son of a bitch. Now I've got a password floating around, and, and it's probably SA, right? That's the username you're going to use. <laughs> So let's run the same command. So I've got the same data, only instead of putting it directly into a local SQL Express instance, I've dumped it into a CLI XML file. CLI XML actually provides a, a pretty good data representation, even of complex hierarchical objects, because XML can display, can, can represent and store object hierarchies. Now these aren't live objects anymore. It's not actually, it's not like it's live updating that file all the time, right? It's just snapshot. But that's all I need for this. And I've written the commands in such a way that I could schedule that to run on every one of my servers. And each of them is going to produce a unique file name because it's got the computer name in there. Right? So that's, that's pretty decent stuff. I could write these out to the local disk and then file copy them somewhere else, central. So do you guys have, um, what are they called, file servers? Do you have those? Well, I, everybody uses Dropbox now, so I don't know. I could just write it directly to a UNC. Maybe if I've got multiple locations, I'm going to write them all to UNC at 8 in the morning. And then at 9 in the morning, I'll run RoboCopy and move them all up to a central UNC over the WAN. Because RoboCopy is pretty good about resuming and dealing with bandwidth constraints. Or what's another way to copy files when bandwidth is a concern built into every copy of Windows? Bits, Bits the background intelligent transfer service. So set up a Set up an IIS box somewhere on your, your central headquarters, wherever you live, and then just use bits uploads. You know we have commands in PowerShell to do that? Yeah. Get command bits. You have to use the DFS replication. Uh, well, that's another option. I like this better. Um, file replication is another pain in the ass. Uh, it, it's touchy. And DFSR is not awesome in low bandwidth situations. Now, maybe you don't have low bandwidth situations. I was in Helsinki. I was getting 75 megabits on my freaking cell phone. You guys clearly have all the bandwidth. Um, in fact, if you ever find yourself with some extra bandwidth, if you could mail it over to us, that'd be great. Uh, bits is great, though, because you can create a new bits transfer, add files to it, and then start the transfer. It does require an IIS on the other end, because this is a web-based thing but you can throttle it. You can tell it only use 1200 baud. And you can stand there and go, whoosh, 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 right, while it does it. 
And so if you, you kind of run that, create the file, and then start a transfer and let it transfer the bits up there, this is all about it eventually getting to the right place. What major Microsoft product uses almost this exact same workflow? SMS 2.0. SMS 2.0 and every version of it after that. Um, actually, the, the modern SCCM does exactly this. It creates all of its inventory files locally on the client and then it uses HTTP bandwidth throttled transfers, that's its default these days, to get that up to a point where it's going to be lazy loaded in. Right? That's why when you boot up your machine and the inventory changes, it takes like three days for it to finally make its way to the, the config man console because config man is all about getting another cup of coffee. Um, so this same workflow, isn't, this isn't a hack and it's not janky or anything like that. This is legit, this is scale. Right? The idea with scale is that you can't have things immediately because there's no way to have things immediately times two million. But if you wanna wait a minute, we'll eventually get it there. And so I've created the file. Let's say I'm gonna transfer it up using bits. If you got something else, if DFSR works for your environment, that's fine. If you just wanna use RoboCopy, whatever. But this is a nice scalable, monitorable way of doing it. And then periodically, so let's say now I've... Uh, how how uh, big is the configuration of the IS? IS? How, how big does the IS need to be? No, 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 no. Configuring it. Are we talking about five minutes? Just install and then you... Um, install IIS, enable the bits feature, that's it. go home. Yeah, pretty much. You'll want to set some file permissions maybe. I don't know. You kids are crazy these days. Everyone full control really. Um, yeah, it's easy. It's not hard at all. Set up a little VM for it. And, and honestly, set up a machine that has IIS and SQL. You can get everything done in one place. A little VM for that. Okay. Um, then, once you've got all those things in a directory, so let's just make a little directory. And then we're going to move my XML file into that directory. That is not annoying. It's not annoying. What's right above us? The rest? No, it's not the rest of the lobby, isn't it? I think they're taking the hotel apart. It is the last. My God. Somebody get a broomstick. So I've got this directory that now presumably will have hundreds and dozens of these things all, all loaded up, right? So how do I get that into SQL Server? You're at a script for that, right? This is my lazy loader script. Well, get child item, star.xml, right? Because I got to get them all, presumably. Import CLI XML. And here's the fun part it's PowerShell. We don't have to commit it to a database. Let's just see what happens here. Oop, there we go. So I'm going to go get all these files. I'm going to bring them into the command line again, into the pipeline as an object with properties. It doesn't matter how many of them I read because each object is already self-identifying. It's got the computer name somewhere. It's got the date it was collected. It doesn't matter what order I stick these in the pipeline. It's all going to wind up in a giant pile of database anyway. So how do I get this into the database? That's it. And then the slash pull through when Remove items. Uh, well, no, I, I, so the suggestion was then pipe it, but there is no pass through. First no, of all, no, 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 no. first of all, you, you, you could accept that at this point after this, I don't have the file anymore. So I could have the next command though, <coughs> remove the file. Yeah. So, oops, illegal type name. Yeah. I wondered if that would work. Please read the book. <laughs> well, it's because um, I'll sh I'll show you why. It's <laughs> just Yeah, I'll show you why. It's uh, this this error that it's spewing right here. This illegal type name on input object. That's mine. That came out of my function. I'll show you where it is. Because I know you don't believe me. 
But if you delete the database and do it again, you're up and running. No. No, I'll, I'll show you. I should stop talking. Um, We're supposed to talk. No, I, that was Tuesday. This is that error message right here. So now tell me why it's broken. Because the object is deserialized. Because the object was deserialized. Right? You guys know about serial, like Lucky Charms and Granola and stuff like that? Right? So when you save something to XML, you're serializing. You're taking an object and putting it into a text format. JSON is another way of serializing. XML is one way. Uh, when I bring this back in, I get a deserialized dot report dot disk space info, which my function doesn't want. It wants to just see the report part. So I could modify the function. Easy enough. I could take that report dot requirement out completely. Um, one way to, to do it would be just to not do this. Meep. Of course, then I'm going to get a table called deserialize.report.diskinfo. So maybe what we'll do instead is. Uh, can, you change, can you change the object type? Uh, I, I absolutely could change the object type mid pipeline. Uh, I don't necessarily want to have to remember to do that every time. If you you could. If you change the array index to minus one, you'll always get the last one. Uh, and that's another thing is always get the last one. So, right, I don't have to do this check at all. Let's just, here, we'll take this out. Very good. And then, so now I'm going to look for a table called whatever the last bit is, at whatever's after the last dot, and that'll be my table name, and I'm not going to check to see if one of them is report at all now. And, and part of the idea here is exactly what you do is going to depend on what you need. And I want to emphasize that the reason this is all PowerShell script is because you can go change it. You can make it whatever you want to. Kind of the original idea of forcing it to have a report was to make sure that people didn't accidentally pipe goofy stuff in here. Or it's just kind of a safety switch. I want to make sure that before you start sending objects into SQL Server that you've thought about it first that you've made sure it's going to work, you know, you're not trying to attach crazy stuff and giant blobs and things like that. Uh, a huge table called PS Custom a, a huge table called PS Custom Object. So I'm just going to I'm just going to kind of put a little barrier in the way. You're going to have to pay enough attention to put the report dot on there. But maybe that's not the situation you need, so you can come in here and change these things. So let's try it again. Uh, let's remove the module so that it reloads the changed version. It didn't blow up. And we've got three rows now. And look, the disk size changed. Because I created that XML file, which took up a little space. Cool? So think about that now. You've really duplicated some of the workflow of something like SCCM in a very scalable way. Dump things to a file, because you know what? There's nothing easier in the world to move around than a file. Text is simple. Replication is hard. Do you know how to troubleshoot merge replication in SQL Server? Me neither. And I've been using SQL since 6.2. But I know how to troubleshoot a file copy. That's pretty straightforward. So get everything in nice, simple text. Move it up to wherever you want to load from and then just run a load job every so often. And yeah, the next thing you would do is go delete those files out probably so that you didn't have to worry about rereading or duplicating or anything like that. So there's some code. Questions at this point? Is this something you would do? Will you, will you, you have this already. Did Why are you sitting here? You should have been next door. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, did you put it on the gallery? Um, SQL reporting is not in the gallery yet. I need to put it there. Uh, but we were, I wanted to make some updates to the book uh, because there was a problem with SQL 2016 and the way I connected. So I wanted to fix that. And I've got that fixed now. I just need to get home because I don't have my API key with me. But yeah, that'll be in the gallery. Well, one of the problems with the early SSM was the 18 Pro, so you miss kind of the continuous inventory. 
you guys have some of the same problems here, you need to be sure that the schedule will go off or something like that on each machine is running. Sure, you, you, yeah, you have to make sure your environment works, and that's part of it. What's one way that you could make sure that that, continue, that scheduled job is always going to run? Three, three letters, talked about it all week. DSC. DSC, yeah. Yeah, and that, I mean, that is literally the point of DSC, is I need certain things to just happen correctly and let the computer worry about that, not you. <coughs> But yeah, yeah, definitely. And the neat thing is you don't have to write a big agent. This would run on nano, I think. Well, yeah. The bit that would get the inventory and create the file would run on nano. The bit that would run SQL Server, not so much. Not yet. But you can combine all these things and just load them as they come. Load it, delete it. So here's another approach you could use. Uh, I'm going to copy that XML file uh, just so I have a, a spare. And we'll do this slightly differently. Uh, we'll start with the get child item still. But we'll pipe it to for each. Any idea why? You can delete it. So I can delete it, yeah. And we'll talk about the downside of this too, but let's just do an import. Uh, we'll take that and pipe it to import dash CLI XML pipe to save dash report data local uh, disk inventory semicolon new command pipe that same file to remove item. Oh, there's a lot of eyes now. There we go. I'm going to parse that for a sec. You don't verify that it's working. Uh, well, I'm not currently, no, I'm not verifying it, no. <clears throat> I, I tend to test and then run with it. Um, but yeah, if there was an error, I would be deleting it. And that's when you start to break something into a little bit more of a script where you put some try around it and you have some error handling maybe. Uh, this is how I always build my way into those things though. What's the downside of this versus the earlier approach? Any ideas? Need to reconnect to the database. Uh, that's yeah. So one downside is I'm reconnecting to the database every single time. Uh, if you look at my command here, uh, that's not it. Do 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 do. I connect in the begin block. So when you send me 30 files, before I get the first one, I'm connecting to the database. And then I process the files, and then I close my database connection in the end block. With this approach, for each is getting one file at a time. So you're piping me one file at a time. So I'm connecting and dropping and connecting and dropping. A little less efficient. Now, if you're just running this against your SQL Server, like that you only use for your admin stuff, you might, maybe you don't care. You're adding, I don't know, this is a local connection, so it's like a less than a millisecond connect time. If you're storing this in someone else's SQL server that like a DBA is looking at, <laughs> they're gonna get pissed eventually. They'll notice. But if you had a saved report data, you could see that it was a file of it, and it would behave accordingly. If my save report data did who? So if it was a file object, then uh, you delete it. Then, then it would save report. It. Save report data could take care of deleting the file. However, it should, if it was a file, how, if it was a file, how, however, that is a wrong and unjust thing to do. Because because now I've built a tool that is doing multiple tasks. I've bound the tool to a specific type of input and it becomes less flexible. There's another downside to this approach too, which is similar in that it will take longer because this script block for 4-H winds up getting parsed each time through. And it's not, I mean, it's not horrible, horrible. We're not talking about mass amounts of data here. You're not gonna wreck the universe, but it's, it's moderately slower. So 
you can you just have to decide you know maybe if you're really relying on this data you want to put some verification in there so it does wind up being I'm going to deal with each one I'm going to I'm going to make sure I didn't get any errors then I'm going to delete that file and then I'll move on to the next one and and it's slower but the price I pay is more reliability can I request something a pass through parameter can you request some no but you can add it you can add it yourself GitHub yeah. yeah. Well, I need to put it on GitHub. Um, but but import cli 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 XML doesn't have a pass through. My uh, import CLI XML doesn't need a pass through because it's putting XML into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. It can't put that and something no, else. No, that's what I mean, sir. So it depends on what it is you wanted to pass through. If you wanted to pass through the object that was piped in, then yes, you could add that. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you right now the reason I don't have this on Git is because I was hoping to be able to run this through the Appveyor stuff that they, they talked about. Did you guys catch that one yesterday? Um, except they're only validating against PowerShell 4 and 5. And this would honestly work in PowerShell 2. And I don't want to take a hard dependency on a newer version if I don't have to. Uh, but it turns out PowerShell.org has a Team City based build service, and I might stick it in there. I'm going to get Dave to explain what that is to me. See if we can make it make it simple. Uh, but, but yeah. Uh, but you can just upload it to the gallery. No checks, no nothing. No, I know I can just upload it to the gallery. I'm just lazy. I, I want I want it to miraculously occur. So um, your earlier statement that you shouldn't make it to do more than basically one thing. Uh, in this case, it actually because of the way you do XML. Uh, sorry, the, the objects versus the files. It makes sense to at least have the ability to do both, to have the internal ability to delete the file. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to uh, or create tools that actually have a like a switch or something to there's, tell you something. Or there's, I disagree. Okay. Yeah. You can, but you you start to you start to create tools that are oh you need to. And you know they all sat back there and they talked about who was going to come in here and give me the five minute wave off. Um, I dislike creating any kind of tool that binds itself to a particular situation. What I would rather do is have this save report data continue to do just that and write another tool which is designed to take a file, send it to report data, and delete the file. I call that a controller because it's taking a, a complete process. Tools. And I'll give you a really good example of a tool. I don't know if you have them here. Well, I think they do. The H&M Home seemed to have a picture of one. You guys seen a hammer? You know what that is? There's a shocking few number of heads bobbing up and down. <laughs> um, a, a hammer in itself is not terribly useful. You need something to hit it against. And you need a, a process for it to be a part of, right? Whether that's framing a house, or hanging a picture, or committing homicide. There's a process with multiple steps. Right, you have to pick up the picture, and you have to hit the wall, and ha or you have to walk over to the person. You have to strike them upon the head. Right, there's, there's, and those are specific. That, that same tool, save report data. That same tool is useful in all of those processes. And so you then write a controller that defines the process for a specific situation. Uh, and those are those are kind of the words I use to describe those two different contexts. I've got controllers that are tied to a specific thing, and they make use of tools. And then the tool itself tries to be as general as possible so that it can fit in the largest number of situations. So I absolutely agree with you, but in this specific occasion where you talk about the connection to the database, mm -hmm. a good controller wouldn't solve that, would it? Uh, not necessarily. I could rewrite my save report data to also accept a connection object. Fair enough. And that would keep it generic. Because there's a lot of situations where you might want to set up a connection and instead of letting the tool create its own, pass one in. And I would make that non-mandatory. And if I ran the tool and didn't get a connection object, then I know I need to set one up. Yep. How hard would it be for you to, uh, to create a function that created that original database that you manually did? How hard would it be to write a function to that created the database so it didn't have to be there? So, um, yeah. Coding it would be relatively easy. The process of connecting and checking might or might not be easy. And here's why. When you connect, you have to provide the name of a database. And so if you don't know up front if that database exists or not, 
then you need to know what kind of database you're connecting to. So for SQL Server, I would connect to master and then I would query master to see if my target database existed or not, create it if necessary, and then change into that database. And that presumes I have permission to do all of those things, which is a, a fairly reserved set of permissions in any reasonable heaven bound environment. So it's, it's technically very simple, um, but practically not. Because if you have this in a production environment, you need to have a service account on the SQL Server or an Active Directory account, and you would not give him access to the master. Or the yeah, other. you don't actually have to have a service account if it's just SQL Express, right? No. It's perfectly happy to run a system. Mm -hmm. If it was a real SQL Server, then yeah, you would probably have, yeah, the permissions and the practicalities around allowing anyone to create a database are fairly, because you're committing disk space and, and all kinds of other stuff. So I, I tend to keep them simple and just create that. Now, here's the deal though. Now that I have that database, I called it disk inventory, right? That was stupid. I should have called it admin stuff because I can have multiple tables in there. So you just go to the DBA and say, look, can I have 10 gigs of space for a database called admin stuff? And then you can run this lots of times with lots of different types of objects. So um, the first thing I thought about was... This is the last one they're going to throw me out of here. I have to throw myself out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking about uh, writing data. As you said, uh, you, you need to have some kind of permission setting. But the first thing I thought about, you should have some kind of write-only uh, permission sets. You, so that you, you couldn't create back anything else. And, that anyone and you have a write-only <laughs> permission set on SQL Server called data, data Writer yeah. already. Yeah, and how you set that up at the database side is a one-time thing that you can set up at the database side. Yeah, absolutely. So, cool. So I'm gonna make sure um, Richard has this code, but it's also part of the book, so you can get it there already if you want to. And I'll get into the PowerShell galleries as soon as I get a hot minute to do that. Cool. What, what book are you at at the moment? What book am I at at the moment? Yeah, the, the book you're talking about. Right? Oh, this is the ebook that's on PowerShell.org. So if you go to our resources menu and click on ebooks, we've got like a dozen free ebooks, and this is the one that says Ditch Excel. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys.